All right. We are in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, picking up in verse 21, talking about the different heroes of faith that are shared in this chapter. Now, faith in God, examples of faith in God, believing God. You know, the simplest definition of faith, of course, is, you know, the faith we're talking about is believing God, believing God's promises and you know, believing what God says to us specifically, believing God's word, uh, you know, very basic level. And then when you get into the New Testament relationship with God that we have through Jesus Christ, it becomes even greater, so that, you know, more, more spiritual faith even than what they had in the Old Testament. They were able to, to do such great and awesome things through their faith in God and what he what he said to them, what he spoke to them about himself and about the coming of the Messiah and all those things. So, as I've stated before, we have a born-again relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Through the power of the Spirit, our faith should be even greater and greater things can be accomplished through faith in, in God. Here, let's go back to the narrative here of some of the different heroes of faith that are mentioned. So we're talking about Jacob, you know, the you know, succession of the line, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Now, by faith, Jacob, and we talked about him last week, how he started out his life. You know, God's hand was upon him. God had a plan for him, a destiny for him. But his, the na his name itself, Jacob, means usurper. And, and, you know, he, of course, was able to take the birthright that ordinarily would go to the firstborn to Esau. And Esau, of course, cooperated with that, as we talked about last week, because he did he despised his birthright, had no respect for it, and the blessing of God that comes with it. But Jacob changed over the course of time, events in his life, and eventually became what God would have him to be, uh, the man that God had planned for him to be. But it tells us here, as far as faith is concerned, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. And so, you know, the story, of course, that of Joseph, you know, his his son that he, he loved that in particular and how Joseph ends up in Egypt and you know how God brought that all about and through Joseph God was able to to save his people because there was a famine throughout all of the land you know everywhere and uh so because of his position in egypt and and because god had given him the uh, insight to to store the grain and all that during the the good times before the famine came and then so people came from everywhere to egypt to buy the grain and all that, including, of course, Jacob and his family. And eventually, Joseph is reunited with his brothers. And then eventually, his father is brought to Egypt to see Joseph. And while he's there, when he's getting ready to die, he blessed the sons of Joseph and said he worshiped God, leaning on the top of his staff. And the interesting thing about that, also, he gave the greater blessing to the younger son of Joseph, which is the way it worked out for him as well. So that was kind of an interesting twist in that. But he was a man of faith and believed God that the promises of God would continue through the family line on down, of course, to the coming of Jesus Christ. And then it says, by faith, by faith in God, Joseph himself then, when he was dying, 
made mention of the departure of the children of Israel you know, out of out of Egypt and gave instruction concerning his bones. He says, when you leave this place, you know, take my bones with you, you know, because he wanted them taken back to his homeland. And it says it was by faith. So we're led to believe then that God spoke to him about these things, and he believed God about all that. Okay. Um, anybody have a question or comment so far? Carolyn has something. So didn't uh, I just notice that it was Joseph that wanted these bones carried? Didn't Jacob request that too? Or, or what, am I getting them mixed up? Joseph wanted one of his bones carried out of Egypt when they all left Egypt, right? Which they did take his bones with them. Joseph did. Yes. But Jacob had not. It's not the one that requested that. Okay. No. No, he did not. I hate it mixed up. What they did, though, yeah, I can understand because when, uh, when Jacob died, Joseph was given a leave of absence by Pharaoh to take his father back to the homeland, back to Canaan, uh, to bury him. So that's probably why you're confused. Yeah. About. Yeah. yeah. And so they did take him back, and and they mourned him for like 30 days. I, I think it was 30 days. Uh, they mourned him because I was, you know, now, you know, in modern times in our society, it's getting, you know, smaller and small, uh, smaller time for the funeral, things like that. I mean, it's very popular now to do it. And I don't, I don't criticize this, but I'm just saying now, oftentimes it's like all done in one day, right? We have the, the uh, visitation or the wake, whatever you want to call it. And the funeral all the same, same day, one day turn around and all that uh, whereas even in, in our own history you know we go back and all of us remember you know at least two days and some of you may remember when it was more than that it was like three or four days to bear you know to go through the, that process and of course the bible doesn't say what's proper i think it depends on what society believes to be proper so it's fine with me as i do it all in and one day I'm just saying things changed over the years. And for that time, it was a longer process. And so it was like 30 days that they mourned for Jacob when they took him back to Canaan. Uh, but he was taken out of Egypt. And so Joseph's request was to be taken out of Egypt also and be buried with his fathers. So. And they did honor that. Anybody else? All right. By faith, Moses, when he was born, not his faith, of course, because he was just a baby. How many know that? <laughs> when he was born, was hidden. So he was a recipient. Of the you know he was in the process, but it was his parents, of course, his mother in particular, that had faith. Was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and it wasn't just because of his physical beauty, because they had faith. So they believed that God was impressing them to spare the child, because of course you know the story. And I'll just repeat it that. The Pharaoh had put out a decree that all the uh, all the male children were to be slain that were two years old and under. And so so many of them were slaughtered that way, but Moses, his parents, hid him. And we know it was under the direction of God because it was God's plan. God had a plan for for the life of Moses. God had, had you know he had a destiny. He was going to be the the leader of God's people that would lead them out of Egyptian captivity. So let me just stop there for a moment. So 
all of us, you know, God has his hand on all of us. God has a plan for all of our lives. What I'm convinced of is this. I, I know things happen. I know circumstances take place beyond our control. But I, be I believe this. Now, if we're not following God's will, that's a whole different thing. But if we're in God's will, we're doing what God wants us to do. We have faith in God. We're trusting God with our lives to be able to do what he has for us to do. Then I think God protects us and keeps us safe because that's his plan. And so it is in the life of Moses. He ordinarily would have been killed. But somehow it doesn't explain how God impressed upon his parent that he was a child of destiny. A beautiful child was one that should be preserved. Not that they weren't all beautiful, but there was something special about that. You know, he, when it says a beautiful child, it's saying he was special in some way. And he was because God had his hand upon him. And they felt like that they needed to, to hide him even though it it brought risk to them if they were found out they they could have been been killed and but they went ahead and they hit him as you know the story they hit him made a little ark for him and hit him in the uh in the river the nile and among the uh bulrushes and stuff close to the shoreline and they were not afraid of the king's command even though, as I said, they, they put them at great risk. And you remember the story. How that one day that Pharaoh's daughter came down to the river and was going to bathe and all that and, and spotted Moses. And again, God at work, right? Even though she knew that all the Israelite babies were supposed to be slain. It doesn't put it in these words, but she also looked at him and thought he was a beautiful child, something special about him. And she took him and adopted him herself. And apparently her father was okay with that. And so his life was spared. Even his own mother was able to nurse him as it worked out. That was God's plan. God has a way of getting his way, right? His plan working out and miraculous things happen if we're in God's will and in God's plan. And so by faith, these things happen. And by faith, it happens for us also. We'll never fulfill God's plan in our life if we don't have faith in God. But if we have faith in God, then things will work out according to God's plan. Anybody question or comment before we move on tonight? And then speaking of Moses himself, because before we're talking about his parents, but, but in verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, when he became an adult, living in the palace, you know, he's been adopted as the as the son of uh, the daughter Pharaoh. So he is a he's in the royal family by adoption, you know, living the good life refused to be called he, he refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of god than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin so he was raised as an egyptian and although he was aware of his family heritage and all that and his mother nursed him and stayed on probably for several years with him after that learned about the heritage of his people he was living it up you know but he was raised as an egyptian and in the worship of their gods and all that kind of thing and so that's when it's talking about the pleasures of sin of having the money to do whatever you want and the you know following after false gods and all that went with that all the corruption that went with that all the sinfulness associated with pagan worship and he came to the point in his life that he had to make a decision if he was going to go with that which he could have could remain as a part of the royal family all of his life 
but he made the decision that he was going to to leave all that and to become one with his people to unite with his people the israelites and you know god was speaking to him god was calling him and and so you know in that whole process god told him that he wanted him to lead his people out of egyptian bondage you know what happened of course he took a detour how many know that in life detours happen sometimes but in his over exuberance taking upon himself he saw an egyptian one day beating on some israelite slaves and he killed him and buried him <laughs> not too well and thought he got away with it but then he was spotted and so he ran for his life because he felt that pharaoh was after him because he left the palace you know rejected his upbringing and all that rejected his mother and so forth identified with the people of god killed an egyptian so pharaoh was after him and so he he fled back in the back on the back side of the desert and and for the next 40 years or so became associated with the midianites and took a wife and all that and so he took a detour and that happens sometimes right that was a huge detour but god still had his hand upon him god still had a calling for him and so he comes he thinks things are, are better he goes he comes back to egypt and god tells him he's going to to use him to lead people out and of course you know the story he says i i really can't speak to these people you know i'm and he said, well, Aaron can speak for you. And and they were able to get a, a following. They were able to get the people united. And they were endorsed by the people to go to Pharaoh himself and speak in the behalf of the Israelites, you know, pleading with Pharaoh to let them go, worship God on Mount, you know, on, on the Mount of God. And so they go and they plead their case you know the story and Pharaoh refuses and Pharaoh refuses and then god sends the nine plagues on the land of egypt and finally releases them and so moses leads them out of egyptian bondage and eventually leads them you know across the red sea and all the miracles and to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, where he receives the commandments and all that, and eventually leads him just on the edge of the promised land before he dies. So it says in verse 26, in his mind, he esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And it goes on, and we'll get into that more in a moment. So what's interesting about this, even though they didn't have a relationship with God, as far as spiritually being born again. So they had limited understanding of these things. They still believe God. In some way, God, we know that God spoke to him. In some way, he conveyed to him, you know, that God had better things for his people. And I'm sure he didn't understand all about jesus christ and his coming but he understood that god was going to redeem his people and it would be through the promise of christ and he didn't understand all that but enough that he believed god he believed god that god was going to bring them out and all that and he considered 
that the reproach of Christ, aligning himself with God and God's promises to be of greater value than the treasures in Egypt, because he looked to the reward. So he understood that there was more in the future to some extent. Right? And that's pretty amazing to have that kind of faith and belief in God when they weren't even born again like we are. They don't have that experience. So how much greater should our faith be, right? It should be, it should be so great in God. And our, you know, God has given us more understanding of you know, Christ has already come and gone to the cross, died for us. And you know, we know that Jesus is coming again for his church. And we have more insight and revelation than they could begin to have. But I think it's true a lot of times their faith was greater than ours today in many ways, sometimes, right? And it shouldn't be that way. We should have great, great, great faith in God. And so it said he didn't fear the wrath of the king. That means initially we left the palace, go back to his people. He did fear the king after he slew the Egyptian. And that's why he left for 40 years to live with the Midianites. Now it does say when he did come back and he began to leave the people and all the plagues came. And of course, the final, the final plague that God sent was an angel that would bring death over all the land of Egypt of the firstborn out of every family. And that included the animals too. And, but certainly more importantly, the people, you know, all the Egyptians. And then, of course, that would have included the Israelites also. But God, in foreshadowing and giving an example of what Jesus Christ would do for us, gave them a, a way to escape that, to escape death. And he said, what you need to do is to prepare the sacrifice and place the blood over the, over the door on the doorpost and on the lintel of the door for the night that the death angel would come through egypt and be ready to leave then right after that and, and to prepare themselves and after they ate you know the meal they were to put on their traveling clothes put your put your shoes on your sandals put on your garments for traveling and all that and be ready to go and you know what happened the death angel did go through and the firstborn of all those who didn't have that which would be the egyptians or any of the israelites that they didn't follow that and it doesn't record any of them that didn't but i mean there may have been and so death did come and there was great weeping and wailing in egypt because of the loss of the firstborn and all the things. Because the firstborn son, you know, was the, the chief inheritor of, you know, in those societies at that time, including Egypt, and would be the one who would step, you know, in the position of leading the family or the clan even or whatever. And so, you know, they had a very important role. So to lose them, you know, was so devastating to lose all of those firstborn. And so Pharaoh relents and lets them and lets them go. So he kept the uh, Passover in verse 28 and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And then they're, you know, they're out in the wilderness. Pharaoh changes his mind, decides to go after them with his armies. You know the story. And, you know, God steps between them and the cloud, the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night to prevent them from getting their too soon when they get to the red sea of course they can't cross the red sea but god opens up the red sea and it says in verse 29 by faith they pass through the red sea as by dry land whereas the egyptians attempted to do so were drowned i know you remember that story also really amazing so you know the cloud is interesting it, it was symbolic of the presence of god the glory of god the shekinah glory of god it was a large, you know, it wasn't a cloud up in the sky. It would come down to like a cloud, you know, like clouds don't come down, but like fog goes up or whatever. And it was a large area because the Egyptians couldn't just go around it. So it was miles and 
diameter and so forth. And it was such that during the day, you would just see, you know, in the daylight, you would just see the cloud. But at night, it would appear as a pillar of fire. You could see there was fire in the cloud at night. It would really illuminate. So it doesn't say so. But my theory is that's the way it was all the time. It's just in the daytime, you couldn't see that as much because it was light out. But at night, you could really see the fire in in the cloud and uh, that so god separated them and so during the night you know god causes this great wind to come and and the waters are uh, rolled back and 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 the wind dries out the ground and so then the israelites by faith were able to walk across of course that all happened as god commanded moses to stretch out his rod and you know, all the waters did all that. And then, you know, God was with them. And they, you know, there was estimated up to maybe 2 million people of Israel, of the Israelites that went across the Red Sea. That took some time. How many know that? It took some time to make that crossing. And God, because of the cloud, prevented the Egyptians from catching up to them before they could get. And so while they were still crossing the Red Sea, Behind them, the Egyptians come in to the Red Sea. And God releases the water back behind them, and it washes over the Egyptians. And then they were able to go across and complete that process of all those people getting across. And But the those of the, uh, of the army of Pharaoh, those that came that he brought out, the chariots, whatever number there were of them, they all, they all drown in... The Red Sea because the waters came in over them. It was a miracle of God. Uh, God even slowed them down when they were trying to cross. The Egyptians, their wheels came off and all that. You know, God had his hand on his people. So I'll leave you with that thought tonight. You know, God has his hand upon us by faith. We also walk. We walk by faith, not by sight. And God intervenes. I know that God doesn't take people's choices away from them we have the right to choose people can choose to do wrong but in the grand scheme of things god has his way he works it all out and only god could do that but in the midst of all these personal choices that we have god still is able to arrange things so that his will for the big picture works out and not only the big picture, but in our individual lives, there's a lot of things, so many things that happen because of the choices we make. How many know that? We make our choices. Where to live and what we do and what we eat, and whether we exercise or don't, and what kind of entertainment. You know, we, we make choices. And other people make choices that affect our life. We know that. But in spite of that, the big picture in our personal life, God has his hand upon us and he works things out so he doesn't interfere with our choices or other people's choices, but still works it out so that his will is accomplished. He still protects us, works out ways. I mean, this wasn't natural for the Red Sea to open up. God did a miracle, right? So that they, you know, and back when Moses was preserved by his parents. That wasn't something that everybody did. That was, that was God God orchestrated that to protect him and preserve him. And we can see God working in our lives too. Everything out according to his will if we cooperate with God. All right. Anybody, questions or comments about what we looked at tonight before we wrap it up? No one? Okay. So that's probably a good stopping point before we get into Jericho and that story. But uh, thank you for joining us tonight, being a part. Appreciate it. So looking forward to Sunday, right? Sunday's on the way. And no doubt we won't have as many people, but hopefully we'll have a good number.
and another great service. All right, have a good night. Bye, everybody.